there is a continuity in life. Not only in natural things, but as we know from our faith, even in matters that pertain to the divine. Everything seems to be woven together in the plan of God when we talk about faith. In this world, in order to put things and to find their proper place in continuity, we talk about context, place an event in a context. And then when you look at the big picture, uh, then that little event uh, that you're describing uh, has a lot of meaning. It's related to. Having said that, I want to mention that ancient religions, ancient religions, are uh, evolving from things to persons. The, you and I are gathered not in remembrance of things, but we are here in remembrance of persons. God the person interested in our welfare. So our context as believers has taken its time. And reason tells us, reason tells us that lots of things take time for us, even today. We're not always able to grasp things right away. I say this because uh, it's a different world in which we live. The world in which I grew up, uh, a 15-year-old didn't know much. Now the 15-year-old can close his eyes or her eyes and work that remote control and fix your telephone for you when you can't fix it yourself. <laughs> True kid, isn't it? Yeah. Remember, it's your mom and dad. You can't teach them everything. All right. That's, that's the way it goes. I can remember when, a few years ago, several years ago, I would say, when I got my first DVD, I thought I was on top of the world, you know. And I didn't know how to even connect the thing, so I got a kid over from the eighth grade from the school. He just came and said, oh yeah, I can do that. Within five minutes, it was all put together. And I looked extremely intelligent, I must say. <laughs> things evolve, things evolve. That's life. Now, having said that much, I also have to plug in for those with a little experience in life. Uh, kids, always remember that you may know the technicalities, but people older than you have experienced breathing and living much longer. That's it. Everybody gets their share now. All right. You're on the wrong side. You're usually on this side, but no, it's okay. <laughs> <clears throat> now, one of the ancient religions, and it's a tongue twister, it's a very ancient religion, Zoroastrianism, just in case you cannot spell it like I, I, I can, anyway. It starts with a Z. Very ancient religion. It's a religion that some people in the world still practice today. Remind you, religion is a way in which human beings refer to a more powerful out-of-this-world relationship. You and I, religion is the way in which we respond to a personal God. Ancient religions that hadn't evolved to the personal God were looking at things that were part of nature, more powerful, they had no control over it, and therefore they thought that is, quote, God. Zoroastrianism is a very ancient religion, a very ancient way in which people relate to what we say the divine, but let's say the more powerful agent. Zoroastrianism is based on the relationship of the heavenly bodies, stars included. So when people uh, devote their lives 
to the control of the heavenly bodies, you can see that in relationship to yourself, and, to, and as I see it to myself, my life is not controlled by the heavenly bodies. My life is controlled by a God who plans and knows what's happening, a personal God. And the Catechism of the Catholic Church tells us very clearly that no matter what the technicalities of the age may be, our God is a personal God. So your life and mine is not really directed by heavenly bodies, but those for whom this relationship to the more powerful agent was based on natural phenomena, they felt the stars directed everything. Now, you know, and I know, especially when we are living in coastal areas, that there is a relationship between the heavenly bodies and nature. Nature, every day's nature. So, the rising and the ebbing of the tides depends on the moon. When I learned that, I thought that was the, the epitome of knowledge for me. <laughs> Your life and my life depends on God, not on the sun, the moon, and the stars. Zoroastrianism believed in astrology because the powers out there were far superior to any human mind. Zoroastrianism is still practiced as a religion in smaller numbers, in smaller numbers than in ancient times. The places where it is very prevalent, Iran, as we say, Iran, Iran, in the old uh, history of Iran, which was Persia, that's the modern country of Iran, in ancient history, the area of Persia. And Persians emigrated to the western part of India in large numbers several generations ago. India is a very tolerant country for religions. There are numerous religions being practiced in India. Zoroastrianism is one of them. Why do I mention it? Because when we put it into the context of world history, the Magi who came from the East were probably Zoroastrians. And the stars had a lot to do with the manner in which life was directed for them. Secondly, people who live in desert countries generally go by the movement of heavenly bodies. The sun, remember the sundial is very old, okay? And it was first put into practice in which country? Starts with an E, Egypt. Out in the east, Egypt, the sundial, okay. Now we bring the three kings, the magi, the wise men, the travelers from the east into the picture. The stars were very important for them. And it told them lessons that no one else could teach. And so this one star was guiding them to search for someone who is very special. And so they began to inquire, and they traveled in the direction of that star and found their way to the manger in Bethlehem. <coughs> so putting that whole thing into context, let's give a little description of these three wise men. They're also called astrologers, Kings, lots of moolah, <coughs> traders. Then and even now, though the ways of travel are very different now, but in those days, as you listen to the proclamation of the scriptures, camels were the ship of the desert. They took you from one place to the other. And anyone who traveled the desert Anyone who traveled the desert didn't do so alone. They had a bunch of helpers with them. And so desert travel is never 
singular travel, it's always caravans. There's a lady who lived in the desert, also from India. <laughs> always caravans, isn't it? There you go. Didn't live in the desert itself, but in that area of the world, Middle East. <clears throat> these wise men, these traders, they had items of trade. And the three items that are mentioned are gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Very expensive items then and very expensive items now. Now, you know how expensive it is because you've got a few gold nuggets, don't you? <laughs> gold, uh, bring it into context, my friends. Gold is a common barter for international consumerism. Your country depends on the amount of gold reserves you have. Our country, lots of gold reserves. Middle Eastern countries, lots of gold reserves. Far Eastern countries, lots of gold reserves. So they were trading in gold. Frankincense, very expensive even today. Incense that we light at the altar is not by any means a penny a pound. It's just the nature of the beast, as they say. It's the nature of the stone, the rock. Sweet-smelling sweet smelling perfume incense. Caravans that would help them to travel, to pitch tent at sundown, to prepare the foods. Most foods were prepared before. Flatbread, a very, very common and uh, ancient uh, food. We think we in invented it, not so. Uh, we're about the last ones who have developed a taste for flatbread. Very common. So they would warm up the flatbread, warm up any of the foods, and of course, the, the kings, the traders, the rich ones, they just sat down and got attended to. Sometimes that's the way the world works even today. <clears throat> Those who have the means sit down, and someone else takes care of feeding them and taking care of their necessities. Not only people, but our kids are that way. I can give you one example. I'm moving right towards the kid. Poor fellow. He, he just gets the brunt of everything. But that's his problem, not mine. <laughs> you get attended to, don't you? I know it. Yeah. Don't be ashamed to shake your head this way. Okay. <laughs> That's the way life goes. <laughs> now, they come into Jerusalem, and the king, uh, the ruling ones were the, the Romans, and it was Herod. And so they go and pay their respects to Herod, and Herod says, and what brings you here? Very nice way of asking, what's your business in my country? And they said, you know, we're traders, and so on and so forth. But we've also been directed by the stars. And we hear that there is a new, they made the biggest mistake they could make. They said to Herod, we hear there is a newborn king of the, Herod got palpitations. What's going to happen to me? If there's a newborn king, what's going to happen to me? Herod got very upset about it, but didn't show it. So in the course of conversation, he said to them, he says, you know, that's wonderful. You just go and find out all about this newborn king of the Jews. And then on your way back to your country, when you're going to cross the desert again and go back, stop in over here. Tell me where this newborn king is so that I may go and pay him homage. Herod was a fox, very cunning. In fact, ancient history will describe Herod as a fox. He calculated everything. If there is a newborn king, where am I? I am the king here. 
Now, travel in those days wasn't catch a plane in the morning and arrive somewhere and return home at night. No. Travel was by camelback, caravans, desert. And if you didn't know your way there, you were lost. Nothing worse than getting lost in the desert. Never been there? Been to the desert, but never been lost in the desert because you always get people who know their way around. <clears throat> Come back and tell me. Took them some time. They didn't just come in and leave. They spent time there. Everybody spent time in a place. There's no hurry of 10 minutes and two seconds, no. They didn't go back because in a dream, they were warned not to go back to Herod. So they didn't go back to him. Now almost two years have passed. I'm going from the scriptures, my friends. Almost two years have passed. They haven't returned back. Herod got nervous about this newborn king of the Jews, and Herod passed an edict. And the edict was all male Jewish babies two years old and under should be. That's part of our Christmas story. The King of kings, the Lord of lords, Jesus Christ, born as an infant, Herod was threatened and passed an edict that all males two years old and under should be slaughtered. And so it happened. In the meantime, Joseph receives a dream. Take Mary and the baby and flee to Egypt because Herod is searching for this child. And we observed the remembrance of that part of our faith history on the 28th of December, the Feast of the Holy Innocents. There are holy innocents being slaughtered in our society even today for different reasons, but pray for them. They haven't had a chance to live. <clears throat> the Epiphany, that's the feast we celebrate today. This means the manifestation of Jesus, Jesus being shown to the world. The world was Jews and Gentiles, born into a Jewish family, living among Gentiles, and the three kings, the three wise men, the three travelers, the astrologers represented the non-Jewish world. And so this feast for us is the feast of the manifestation, the showing forth of Jesus to the Gentile world. You and I are Gentiles by blood. We are non-Jewish. Our brothers and sisters of the Jewish faith gave us the faith even though the classification in terms of societal things is Jews and Gentiles. We are Gentiles. We have received the faith. Our forefathers in the faith were of the Jewish tradition. That's why we say our forefathers in the faith. Jesus was a good Jew. And I'll tell you a story that may bring a smile. I may have said it before. At my age, I keep repeating it, and I think it's new. But don't laugh at me. You guys do the same thing. You know? So the good Irishman, <clears throat> Sean, had a son by the name of Pat. Why Pat and Sean are Irish, I don't know. But anyway. <clears throat> and he had a good friend, Rabinowitz, who was a rabbi. So Pat said to the rabbi, he said, Abraham, you know what? My son is going to become a priest. And the rabbi said, so what? What if he's a priest? He wasn't very impressed. He says, you don't understand this. He says, if my son is a good priest, they may make him a Mancinia. Mancinia is just a title. 
uh, make him a monsignor. You know, a priest who's done some good work for the church and so forth. And Abraham said, yeah, Monsignor, so what? Well, if he's a good Monsignor, they may make him a bishop. And of course, at the same time, Sean is getting red in the face because Abraham's not catching on, you know? And he says, Bishop? Ooh, oh, what's the big deal? Well, if he's a bishop, they may make him in charge of a group of bishops, and he's an archbishop then. Abraham was still not impressed. Archbishop? You don't understand this, Abraham, do you? No, I don't want to either. Well, if he's an archbishop, someday they may make my son, Pat, a cardinal. And Abraham says, cardinal? Mm, what's the big deal? He gets a red hat and that's it. Hmm. And you know what? The cardinals elect the pope. And if my son's a cardinal, they may elect him to be the Pope. And Abraham said, not impressed at all. Imagine Sean, his face is red now. I can't turn red, I turn purple. But anyway, <clears throat> so he wasn't impressed. And then pretty soon, Sean says to Abraham, he says, Abraham, he says, what do you think? You think my son is Jesus Christ? And at that stage, Abraham says, no, 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 that's one of our boys. <laughs> Jesus, the good Jew, who brought us the way of salvation. The world comes to see him in this feast of the Epiphany by the visit of the Magi who traveled distances for trade and also to spread the good news. Who knows, my friends? We don't know, I don't know, the scripture doesn't mention it, but maybe I'd like to think that these magi at some stage became believers in Jesus Christ, the savior of the world, amen. amen. What did you say? Amen. I didn't hear it. Amen. Remember, I'm hard of hearing. The feast of the epiphany, please stand.